Modern horror films rely heavily upon the talent and imagination of special effects artists who take the spectacular and unbelievable and make it very real. On the outskirts of Hollywood lies XFX Studio, where special effects artist Steve Johnson designs the objects that nightmarish films are made of. Steve is part of the new breed of special effects artists who are enjoying a prominent role in today's horror entertainment industry. Once Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi commanded the horror audience's respect. Now it is the special effects artist who receives the praise. This is stupid, but let's just... You want to make sure it blasts really good. Right now the business is so crowded. Things have really changed, but even when I started first getting into it, if you don't always want to push further and always want to try out something new and approach it from a different angle, then you're not really going to have much of a fighting chance in the industry because there are so many people in this business and it's interesting because now it's a much more of a legitimate thing than when I first came out here. When I first came out here, uh, it was really nothing to do. I mean, 11 years ago, the, the state of the art of the, the public knowledge of this kind of stuff was practically non-existent. And so it was kind of a strange thing, and there weren't all that many people getting into it. In that respect, I was lucky. But now there are monster magazines all over the place, television shows like this one. And kids across America see it and point it to their parents and say, that's what I want to do for a living, and it's a legitimate thing now. I think people have gotten very sensitized or desensitized to effects. And in a way, it's not like an amazing thing. They don't, I mean, it's, it's amazing to them, of course, but they expect it now. I mean, I think when people go to a, a movie these days, more often than not, they feel cheated if they don't see something amazing in the film. It's like, where were the special effects? Like, you know, let's, let's go down the way and see another movie. I just wasted seven bucks and there wasn't a single effect in it. I think my favorite person would have to be Rob Bottin. Um, probably because he comes up with the wildest, most different ideas, and I think he chooses his projects very well, which is really important. He uh, is an excellent designer, and as I said before, pretty much these days, I feel, and this is a broad understatement, but I feel anyone can do the basics. So now how I judge people's talent or competency is in design. As I said before, I think that's really the only true art left in this business, and that the, the, uh, the keys to all of the things that used to be secrets are in a hundred books these days, and, and videos, and anything. So it, now the art really shows through because people have to be good designers in order to stand out in this business, and I think Rob is an excellent designer. He's really good. He did Legend, uh, of, I, well, actually it was released as Legend, and did the, the demon makeup on Tim Curry, which is one of the most beautiful designs I've ever seen makeup effects-wise. Perhaps the complexities and problems of modern society have caused audiences to demand increasingly sophisticated cinematic illusions. Special effects to shock, humble, and even outrage those that pay to see the films. I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, get to work on time. Uh, what? You came out of frame. Let's do that again. Real quick. Okay, it's okay. Oh, I'm hitting him in his hair. <laughs> this is a guy who builds a bat, expects me to hit an actor with it, but he can't take it with himself. Here's the effect right here on the hand. Bam. There's a chamber in it that's filled with blood. So when you, the idea is when you hit, it spatters blood. And it's supposedly soft. <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiasm is actually very, very important. Um, the market is probably pretty much flooded right now. I mean, as I said before, this is a legitimate thing, and uh, kids love it. I mean, it's, it's a real cool thing now. And, and so there's a lot of kids coming out here from all over wanting to do this, and there's a lot of work, obviously. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's working. It's coming together. Okay, what we have here is a mechanical understructure for a close-up head for a Cool Whip commercial that uh, my studio built uh, at the end of 1988. We, uh, it's for a Cool Whip commercial, it's a talking cow. Um, they wanted the face to articulate the words very, very well. Uh, a little bit better than Mr. Ed, so we built a mechanical cow for them. Um, we did two cows. We did a full body that could be seen with real cows, and then we did this one um, as an insert piece. Uh, the reason for that was we needed to get so much articulation into the face that it would have been very difficult for us to articulate the full body as well as we did this one. We had much more access. For Nightmare on Elm Street 4, what we handled really was the death sequence of Freddy at the very end of the film. Um, I don't remember exactly how many. It involved probably 10 or 12 different effects, all on different scales. 
Um, the basic concept of the, of the sequence was that all of Freddy's victims from the past are getting back at him by punching their way out of his body from the inside out. So uh, we approached it in a more surrealistic sense than a bloody sense. We had, um, we wanted to give the impression more that these things, there were arms, legs, torsos, heads growing out of them rather than breaking out of them. We didn't really want to spill a lot of blood in this. Um, one reason being of, uh, because of fear of censorship. Uh, also, we thought it had a more fantastic uh, feel to it this way. This is um, obviously the biggest thing we did. It's um, a full scale. It's, it's probably about 18 feet tall from the groin to the top of the neck. Uh, Freddy body, um, and we actually got actors and actresses in there to try to punch their way out of it. Um, and we intercut this with smaller models, actually on Robert England, um, the Freddy Krueger character. And uh, they used a lot of smoke, a lot of Dutch angles, a lot of moving cameras to uh, kind of conceal the fact that we were cutting between large and small scale props. And it worked out pretty well. It's more like a machine gun barrage of, um, of cuts in the final edit, and uh, I think it worked out pretty good. This is an effect that we designed actually for the, the one of the very last shots where a face grows out of uh, Robert England's face, Freddie's face. At the end of the film, his face actually divides, bifurcates into two faces. Um, so we had kind of a mechanical de device and a vacuum effect happening. Um, for a lot of reasons, the effect was cut from the film, um, as is often the case in this kind of stuff. There you can see the face forming. Um, we never really got it to a more finished stage than this. Um, in this um, version of it, um, we ended up simplifying the effect when we actually took it to set. Uh, they felt that it just probably didn't go along the, the same lines as the rest of the stuff we had done, so this one never made it. Disney approached me this summer um, about doing a mechanical spider, a blue screen puppet. Um, this is where a lot of times what we do works hand in hand with optical enhancement. Uh, we wanted to make this actually look like a real spider. Um, so in order to be able to operate it more easily, we built it about three times oversized. This actress, Lindsay Frost, um, comes to a point in the film when she deteriorates in front of camera. So we used several tricks. Um, one of them involved her arm falling off as she reaches out toward uh, the actor and Treat Williams in this case. This is again from Dead Heat. Um, this scene was eventually cut out of the film, um, but <laughs> It's a pretty funny scene. There's the, the, the big giant birthday cake gets wheeled in. It's Joe Piscopo's birthday, and uh, a dancing skeleton pops up out of it, eventually wore a nice, sexy bikini. And what we did here is we had um, an actress, it was Linnea Quigley, in this case, uh, wearing a black velvet suit shot against black uh, with direct attachments to movement points of the skeleton. Um, for instance, her head had a rod attached directly to a, a helmet that went directly into the back of the skull. So when she moved her head, the skeleton head moved. Um, rods come out of the elbows of the skeleton, and she grabs onto the, the rods, which had the handles on them as well, to move the wrists. Uh, her hips have pivot points attached to the skeleton hips. So basically, all she had to do was dance in a very exaggerated manner, and the skeleton would dance as well. Carol syrup, thinned with a little bit of water, food coloring. It's not just red, though. You have to put a little bit of green and a little bit of yellow in there to give it that kind of brownish tint. I think it reads better on film, actually, and looks a little bit more visceral if it's not bright, bright red. If you prick your finger and look at it under bright light, it's pretty vibrant red, but I think it's a little bit more visceral and more gut-wrenching to see a little dark brown to it, because that's the way it starts to look when it's coagulated, and I think somehow that triggers something in people's heads that makes them think it's a little more disgusting. And then you just need something that will make it a little more opaque. Uh, you can put baby powder in it if you suspend it and shake it up before you use it. Um, that's probably the easiest home recipe for blood, but don't put it on your pancakes, kids. <laughs>